Oh, did I fix that? Oh, hello. There we go. Hmm, there's still a bit of an echo. I'm not sure what that is. Anyway, hi. Well, I work on that. Welcome to, uh, I'll fix that just, just a second here. Um, why is there an echo? Well, welcome. Sorry, I'm not being a very good uh, introduction here. Is it because of this? Um, we are going to get started in just a little, there we go. Ah, I don't think you could hear the echo, but I could hear the echo. Um, yeah, we're going to get started in just a second here. Uh, sorry for that uh, strange introduction. Um, History Chats is going to get started at 1230 here. If you're joining us live, uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon, this, this very snowy afternoon. Um, if you're watching this after the fact, uh, feel free to skip ahead a couple minutes if you want to just get to the program. Um, and for everybody else who is joining us live, thank you. Um, I'm just going to make sure that... Yeah, good. Cool. Um... Let me, let me uh, take some moment here to, to thank our sponsor. Uh, Yankee Bookstores have been our sponsor for History Speaks and History Chats, our, our online uh, digital programming, um, which has been great. So big thanks to them. Um, and as well as, of course, to all of our members here at the Marathon County Historical Society, um, whether that's a individual, family, business, uh, you make it possible for us to do this and all the other stuff that we do to keep local history around. So uh, thanks for that. If you're not already a member and you're interested in pretend, potentially supporting um, these sort of programs, uh, feel free to check out our website, marathoncountyhistory.org, um, or you can just come on in and maybe give us a call if it's snowing like it is right now and you don't want to go outside your house. Um, yeah. Um, so this month, to, to round out December uh, for 2021, um, our theme is we're, we're kind of doing a it's sort of a meta type thing here. I thought, like, hey, why don't we do the history of Marathon County's history? Um, I think we also have have went with the term uh, just Marathon County Historical Society's history, but um, it is kind of an interesting thing of just like how in the past have we looked at historical preservation and telling good stories and things like that. Uh, so last week we had Gary Gusselman talking about historical walking tours. Uh, we're going to be talking about Log Jam today. Um, and then next week, we are going to talk about uh, kind of a general uh, theme of uh, the, the early years of Marathon County Historical Society, the, the Ed Schoenberger years, for those of you who maybe remember Ed's tenure as the director here, uh, back when we had a lot of arts and crafts and, you know, events and stuff like that, that we don't necessarily do today, but that were, um, you know, very much of their time and very fun. So we're going to hear a lot about that next week. Um, and then we have some more stuff to round out the year. Um, yeah. So look, come. Uh, these are always at twelve thirty at on Thursdays. If you want to join us live, as as you might be doing now, um, and then we have the recordings available later if you can't make it live. Um, let's see. Cool. Looks like we have some people joining us. That's always great. I'm gonna try not to look at that as we go, but um, yeah, I think we're at. I think we got everything done. Um, that we need to do before. So I don't, uh, we jump right into the the history here. Um, so today we are, as I said, we we're going to talk about log jam. Um, let me see if it's right. Here we go. And um, we're going to be joined by uh, Martina, who's going to be taking us through the story. So uh, take it away. Uh, all right. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for joining in today's chat. Um, my name is Martina Kustrava. I am the assistant archivist here at the Historical Society, uh, and I'm going to be telling you about the Great Wisconsin River Logjam uh, that was hosted by the Historical Society. Um, so for those of you who may be wondering what Logjam was, it was a living history festival, and again, it was put on by the Marathon County Historical Society in the 80s into the 90s. Uh, so about 10 plus years. And during that time, it was the the body of the Historical Society. Uh, it was what the Historical Society was known for um, because it was a very big event. Um, so the title, Log Jam, was created by Carrie Von Netchen, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, at a brainstorm session in the museum library. 
And when I say museum library, I'm not talking about the one at the Woodson House. I'm actually talking about uh, the one that would have been at the Yaki House. So before the Historical Society was where it is now at the Woodson House, everything was over at the Yaki House. So the museum and library, I think we're all on the second and third floors. Um, so a little different from what we're used to today. Uh, Logjam became a major event that attracted uh, a lot of people. The goal wasn't about money. It was about education and fun and learning about various ethnicities that make up Wausau. And whoop, before we get uh, started, I just want to give a, a shout out, a thank you to Tom Schleif, who was the museum director during Logjam, and he was the creator of Logjam. Um, and Brian Williams, uh, he was a planner for Logjam, and he helped with the setup, and he was also a reenactor. And then Kathy Volkman, uh, she was the head volunteer during Logjam, and she ran the museum's food stand. And today she's our collections um, curator. So just a thank you to them for speaking with me and giving me some really good stories and some really good information. Um, here I have an article from the Wasa da Daily Herald, uh, June 2nd, 1991. So this is kind of in the middle of uh, when Log Jam was popular. Um, I wanted to use this because it has a great photo of Tom and it speaks about how success successful Tom was during the event. Um, he was a marine actor and a musician, so that is how he kind of created contacts um, for the marine actors and musicians who attended uh, um, the festival from attending other festivals in Milwaukee. And he also helped start Blues Fest <coughs> and Live at the Blues Cafe in Wausau. Um, so this article mentions that Tom likes uh, theme parties and he has gotten pretty good at throwing them. And it mentions that uh, 25,000 people showed up for the previous Log Jam in 1990, which was a really uh, great turnout. Um, also, Tom's goal for the Historical Society was to get the public involved. Um, that was the, uh, the reason he created Log Jam, is to get people more involved with history in the community. Um, so before it became known as the official Log Jam, uh, the early festivals were actually referred to as Living History Festivals, or this one was called Lure of Lumber, uh, and this one happened in 1987. So the year prior to the first official Log Jam, that would take place at Oak and Fern Islands. Um, it had a lot of the same things as the big Log Jam would have, uh, just on a little bit of a smaller scale. So they had opening ceremonies, they had the ethnic foods, ethnic groups, uh, crafts, and demonstrations. And I just want to point out here on this brochure that I have on the screen that under Saturday at 11 a.m., they had trial and punishment public flogging. Uh, so I think that's a pretty interesting event uh, to have. I'm not sure if it was at the official uh, big log jams, but I just wanted to point it out because it was, it's kind of unique. And here I'm going to show you some of the early festival photos that uh, took place on the Yaki House grounds. Uh, we can he see here that there. this is what looks to be like the Native American dancers and music group performing in the formal gardens. Um, so I think it's just a good representation of what the smaller festivals looked like. And I, like, I just want to point out uh, the fountain here. Now we have a fountain in the middle, and here they have it taken out. So I'm not sure why that was like that. And then on the picture on the right uh, is of a teepee on the front lawn in front of the Yaki house. And some more photos. Um, the picture on the top left is of a man who he was referred to as Whip, and he would perform bull whip tricks with people. And the second photo is of a fur trade encampment showing an example of what that lifestyle would have looked like. Um, also, many of the volunteers uh, that were at the early festivals would also work at the official event too. Here we have um, an amateur lumberjack competition. Uh, he's throwing, uh, it looks like he's practicing axe throwing. And then just as the second photo is of some reenactors 
And I just, I really like this photo. I think it um, captures the reenactors' uh, costumes very well. And here I have an article from, again, the Wassa Daily Herald, January 10th, 1988. Uh, so this is an, an announcement of the first log jam. Um, and we can see that it was already expected to be a pretty large event early on. Uh, it reads that last year's Lure of Lumber event attracted more than 2,500 visitors. Schleif thinks that a river event, emphasizing the ethnic history of the area, will attract many thousands more. And he was very right. Um, so again, if I haven't mentioned it, the official log jam was held on over on Fern and Oak Island parks. And here we're gonna get right into the official log jam. So with here's a photo of the opening ceremony. Um, so I talked to Brian Williams more about the opening ceremony because I was wasn't clear on what exactly took place during that event. And he said that in the morning, all the various groups would form up and march to the demonstration area. Uh, these would include Rogers Rangers, the British Colonials, Civil War reenactors, French Marines, etc. Uh, once they were all assembled according to their groups, the narrator Jim Hawkins would start reading a speech, and the speech would mention each group individually and the impact that they had on Wisconsin history. And as they were announced, they would enter into the uh, demonstration area and at the end of the speech they would every group would shoot a volley in the air and then log jam would be officially started um, and I have a couple photos of examples of groups entering into the grounds so here's one and the next one some Scotsmen and if you look in the background we can see some buckskinners um, for traders entering also. So uh, how this was laid out on the grounds, uh, each group was kind of sectioned off on their own. So we had the Native Americans, the teepees, then we had the fur traders, the Civil War camp. It was all kind of divided into their own areas. Um, so here we have the Native American village. Uh, so if you remember the early photo of the festival of just the one teepee on the Yaki House grounds, now we have an entire village of teepees. Uh, Kathy mentioned that in the morning you could see smoke rising out from the tops of the teepees, and she said that was a pretty neat sight. Um, and I just want to talk about the setup and the equipment. Um, so this was all done by volunteers. Uh, the Carpenters Union helped with the setup, and again, they did this all for free. Um, and then the volunteers from the museum. Um, so a lot of hard work, uh, and it took two semis to hold all of the equipment for log jam. Two semi trailers, uh, so beer garden fencing, crafters tents, the front gates for the grounds, it was all in semi trailers. So a lot, a lot of work. And then here's an example of the Native American dancers entering onto the grounds uh, during the opening ceremony. And then fur traders. Um, here's a picture of a buckskinner or a fur trader. I kind of had a hard time finding good photos for an example of the fur trade encampment. This is the, the best one I could find. Um, and I think it would be a really good photo, except for the fact that he's holding a camera. <laughs> so it takes away of the um, realness of the photo, but I still like it. And then our Civil War camp. Uh, there were over a hundred campsites in the Civil War camp. So again, a lot of setup, a lot of preparations to get that all ready, and a lot of reenactors. Apparently they had a horse. And then this is a photo from Log Jam of 96. Um, I just want to note that there's a child in the photo and then a Scottish man. So I don't know how exactly he fits in to that uh, Civil War camp, but he's there. And another note, we do have this cannon uh, in our collections, and it does work. 
Uh, here's a picture of the Revolutionary War Group marching, and I would just like to point out the women in the background are also an appropriate uh, time era attire. And one more photo of the Revolutionary War men. Uh, this is a one from one of the first log jams, so either 88 or 89. And then the logging and steam engine area. So featured here were the steam tractor and the sawmill. So here's a photo of the sawmill. And Kathy talked to me about what that building was being built in the background, and I don't recall what it was, but it's on the islands. And then here we have um, a photo of the steam tractor. And also in this area, we had horses demonstrating skidding logs. And then we have the Shears Lumberjack Shows and an amateur lumberjack competition. Uh, so the Shears Lumberjack Show included log rolling, pole climbing, axe throwing, and chopping, uh, all by professionals. And they're still around uh, in Hayward and Woodruff, Wisconsin, so you can definitely check out their website if you want to see a little bit more about them. And also on Saturdays and Sundays of Log Jam, they open with a lumberjack pancake breakfast, which I bet had to be delicious. So here is the Shears Lumberjack Men uh, cross cut sawing and pole climbing. and then log rolling. And also on many years of log jam, it would coincide with the World Cup kayak races. Um, so here are a couple photos of that, which I think are pretty cool uh, shots. And then crafters, uh, there were 30 traditional crafts that were demonstrated, uh, and throughout the years of Log Jam, those numbers just continued to grow. I think in later years of Log Jam, there were about 50, and I think one year even 70 uh, crafters. And so here we have a stained glass maker, and I'm just going to read from one of the brochures, uh, some of the crafters that were there. So there were basket makers, quilters, spinners, weavers, black powder gunsmiths, Native American bead workers and quill workers, corn husk doll making, uh, rose mauling, Ukrainian egg painting, and German and Polish paper cutting. So here I have a photo of the rose mauler, and I just recently learned what rose mauling is. Uh, it's a Norwegian form of art that translates to flower painting, and it's typically painted on wood, and it features delicate flowers and scrolls, and it can be used on walls chairs, trunks, and anything that needed a little more detail. And then here's a puppeteer stand. Um, another thing I'd like to mention is that our very own Linda Forbes, our creator of textiles, had a craft stand making rendezvous, rendezvous clothing at the log jam, so that's how she wound up with us. Uh, Polish folk crafts. And one of my favorites, a violin maker. Um, I think that's a pretty uh, neat thing to have there. Um, and then ethnic foods. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any photos of the food uh, stands that were at Log Jam, so I kind of improvised and found uh, some pictures of food that would have been similar to what was there. Uh, so the ethnic food stands that would have been at Log Jam in included American Indian, German, Korean, Laotian, Hmong, Scottish, Norwegian, Finnish, Italian, Jewish, Polish, Bulgarian, and Yugoslavian. Um, another thing, uh, no beer was served at the early events because they wanted to keep it family friendly, but later on, in order to raise some more money, they did start serving uh, beer. Uh, and then here's a photo, I believe, is uh, the great-grandmother's kitchen. Uh, so just an example of what a 
very early uh, stove would have looked like, um, kitchen utensils, the women dressed in appropriate attire. And then music and entertainment. Uh, music and entertainment was a huge part of Log Jam. And on the first opening weekend of Log Jam, they had Judy Collins perform at the Grand Theater Friday night. Um, others who performed are Peter, Peter Ostrowski and the Mando Boys, Claudia Schmidt, Lou and Peter Berryman, uh, Northern Lights, Sparky Rucker, Tom Pease, and many others. Um, later, later years included the First Brigade Band and the Tommy Dorsey Orchestra. Uh, music was mostly regionally famous. Uh, the blues came out of Chicago and Minneapolis. And then evenings of Log Jam uh, started to become more rock and roll. And here's a photo of some ethnic groups performing under the large yellow circus tent. Uh, this tent housed the main stage and where the headliners would perform. So some ethnic groups who performed were Native American drum and dancers, the Scottish pipe band, Norwegian dancers, Bulgarian folk ensemble, Hmong musicians and dancers, German dancers, Italian, Polish dancers. So a lot of ethnic groups. Here are a few photos of those groups performing. And the Scottish Pipe Band. And here I have another article from the Wausau Daily Herald dated June 20th, 1988. And it's discussing the results of the first log jam. And it was a huge hit. Uh, they estimated there to be about 15 to 20,000 people at the first log jam in 1988. Uh, the article reads, We'd be willing to bet there are a lot of bone-tired people in Wausau area today, but we bet their satisfaction in a job well done goes just as deep. Um, and then later years, uh, they approximated there to be about 25 to 30,000 people uh, attended, if not more in some years. And that's because it was an additional summer event other than the fair. Um, otherwise, during this time period, there weren't a lot of summer things to do in Wausau. Um, then I just want to include a couple of key things um, from Log Jam. So I have a map of a hand-drawn map of the grounds that I found mixed in with our Log Jam collection. Uh, and I know it's kind of hard to see, so I blew, blew up the photo and highlighted just the bottom right corner. Um, so you can see that there is a candle maker set up on the left hand side. And then above that it has Trader's Row. That is where the uh, crafters would have had their tent set up. We can see the demonstration area mapped out here. As well as a little guy uh, in the canoe in the water off to the side. Um, and the notes on the bottom read uh, about notes that things need to be made or what needs to be done. So uh, the fur trade needs a 4x4 four four sign. The French Marine sign needs to be made. Roger, uh, Rogers Ranger sign to be made. So I think it's a good example of just how much detail and planning went into this event. And I think one thing uh, highlighted from the years is Molly and the Haymakers performed uh, in 1996. And they were one of the larger groups to perform at Log Jam. And they were very popular at the time. Uh, they originated from Hayward, Wisconsin. And uh, their genre varied between country and folk and rock. Uh, and they toured across the country as well as Europe. So pretty popular at the time. And then here I have a photo of the bridge connecting the two islands. Um, so flooding of the river happened almost every year prior to setup, uh, which made the whole process a little more difficult for everybody. But specifically in 1990, the river flooded the grounds entirely and everything had to be moved to where the farmer's market is held today. Um, things were actually washed away down the river, like tents and other equipment, and they had to be fished out of the river. Um, so that wasn't the best weekend, <laughs> but it was still successful. Um, in the 90s, the free trolley and shuttle service was added, 
and it took people from downtown Wassa parking lots uh, to the log jam grounds and to the kayak races. Um, and that was a pretty a popular thing because traffic to get to log jam, I t- was told, was terrible. So people really enjoyed the service. And then in 1992, there was a train uh, that gave people rides from Wausau to Merrill and back. And it was uh, a steam locomotive. Uh, the engine was Chicago Northwestern number 1385. And it was owned by the Mid-Continent Railway Historic Society of North Freedom, Wisconsin. Uh, it held 400 passengers and coach and 56 in first class. And it included a bar and hors d'oeuvres in the dining car. And that weekend was sold out. Uh, You had to buy tickets to get onto the train, and it was completely sold out. And then I'm, I was told that there was a diesel train that took place, uh, again, giving people rides from Merrill to Wausau in 1994. But it's a little fuzzy if this actually happened or if it was canceled last minute. So I'm just judging from the brochure, it took place. Um, So I'm assuming there was two trains. Um, and I was told in one of those years that Tiny Tim, the musician most famous for singing Tiptoe Through the Tulips, uh, actually rode the train to Logjam, uh, and he performed for an hour for free. Uh, and the feedback about this was actually really great. Um, I know some people have some mixed feelings about this performer, but he did perform for free, which was great, and he played songs all from memory. Uh, And I'm told he wore a white tux with long coattails and he had bright red hair. And here I have another article from the Daily Herald uh, from 2000. Uh, This is unfortunately talking about uh, that logjam was canceled last minute in uh, 2000. Um, It says here that 30,000 deficit in 1999 contributed to cancellation. But there are actually a lot of reasons why Logjam uh, ended. Again, like it does say, money wasn't being made. And tickets were pretty cheap. So around $5 to $6 a ticket uh, in later years. Earlier years, I think they might have been about $3 to $4. So pretty cheap. Um, Two, uh, music Uh, was getting to be pretty expensive, especially performers who performed more towards the night. They were more popular bands, which costed more money. And three, the weather wasn't always nice. Uh, Sometimes it could have been pretty hot, uh, rainy, and like I mentioned earlier, there was flooding. Um, And it just was hard on the people who were doing the setup uh, for them to continue doing it. They were getting tired. Um... Uh, fourth reason, they couldn't find anybody to do public relations, and the event needed sponsors to run. Uh, there were actually sponsor wars in some weird years between Coke and Pepsi and some beer companies. And the common thing that I heard from talking to uh, Tom, Brian, and Kathy is that it was so much work. Uh, a lot of volunteers, and through the years it just gets harder and harder Um and a last reason is become is because Tom Schleif left for a better job in California, and no one's going to pass up pass up a better job opportunity. So, but in this article, he kind of gets a lot of heat uh, for leaving, and he does write a response to this article, and I just want to read a couple things from that article that Tom wrote. Um, He says, the Logjam Committee, over the last five years, has created the Logjam Bible. It is a book that lists every contact, every aspect of what needs to be done to put on Logjam in great detail. And we do have the Logjam Bible here at the Historical Society, and it is full of details, (laughs) full of uh, the contacts that were needed uh, to put on the event, as well as, like, I found the hand-drawn map in that book. Um... And then he goes on to say, Logjam has not been financially successful the last two years. It has been losing attendance the last three years. Is the museum supposed to continue doing an event that is no longer successful financially? Events have their lifespan, and I think Logjam may have reached its end. Some new blood, a little break, some new ideas, and who knows, it may be back bigger than ever in a new form. One thing I do know 
is a community needs to support events by attending them or they will go away. And I think that's a great uh, lesson to learn that um, it's a good reminder to attend local events. Owasa has so many events, um, parades, fairs, chalk fest, events at the Grand Theater, um, holidays at the houses we just had uh, at the Historical Society. So if you enjoy events, uh, it's a good thing to remember to attend them. And then lastly, uh, I came across some photos of some fireworks um, that I'm assuming wrapped up the festival or the kayak races, but I thought it was appropriate to end uh, with these photos. Um, overall, I think Log Jam had a great run of 11 plus years. Um, that's a really long time for an event on the scale that it was on. Um, and museum and historical societies have eras and their focus is always changing, which isn't a bad thing. Um, sometimes it just gets better throughout the years. Um, and next week, we're going to see, again, how even more different the historical society was in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Uh, in that history chat, we're going to learn all about how different it was. And I think that this event, Log Jam, was a special one. Um, talking to those involved, I could sense that it is something that holds a lot of meaning to them which is understandable with how much blood, sweat, and tears that these people put into this event. And I'm thankful that I got to learn so much about such a unique event. And I'm glad I got to tell you all the story of the Historical Society's Great Wisconsin River Log Jam today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Martina. I, I, I was thinking, um, for, for, for those of you who are watching, I, um, I approached Martina a couple months ago at, relatively new new member of staff here um, and, and not from Wassa necessarily. So uh, I said, hey, do you want to learn log jam? And she jumped right in and um, did, did a great job of pulling out as much as she could here. So a great job. Um, we did have a couple things that were said uh, here just to clarify. Um, oh, shoot, lost it. The, the building. Oh, come on, Facebook. Decided it didn't need to show me these, all of the comments anymore. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, Kathy, Kathy just uh, corrected to, to say that the, the, the behind the sawmill, the pictures that we saw, that was the Island Palace Apartments on River Drive. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Scott Peterson was saying that he he actually uh, you know has pictures of the nineteen ninety four diesel train. So. Um, it looks like that maybe did happen, but um, okay. who knows? Maybe there's something else uh, going on there. It's, it is always difficult to kind of sort through everything. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, if anybody else has any last minute questions here, we'll give you a little time. Um, like, like Martina said, we will be going, um, uh, another new member of staff, uh, Eric, is going to be talking about uh, the early days of the Yaki House Museum um, next week. So again, if you're interested in that, um, Put up the, got the, the nice VW bus, uh, the history mobile um, for that era. Um, so he'll be doing that next week. So that'll be an, another uh, chance at, at learning about some of the old historical stuff that we used to do. And that'll be great as well. Um, oh, there we go. Just see if there's any other, any other things. Right. Well, I think we'll maybe call. I'm usually what happens is as, as soon as I hit end end stream, uh, that's when the questions come in. So I apologize, but um, yeah, I think we'll we'll call it there. Um, thanks again to Martina for the the presentation of of this this great period in our history here, and uh, thanks to all of you for for joining us. And I uh, hope you have a, a wonderful afternoon, and we'll see you next week for some more.